Over the next couple weeks, we're going to be looking at the book of Jude. Jude, well, it's actually a letter more than a book. Well, truthfully, it feels a li little bit more like a post-it note than an actual letter. Now, to find Jude, if you, this is your first time hearing about it or you don't know where it is, it's real easy to find Jude. Go to the end of the Bible, go to Revelation, turn to the left one page, and there you have it. There's Jude. If you've never heard a sermon on it, that's not surprising. Or if this is your first time to ever hear it's in the Bible, uh, it's probably because it's only 25 verses long. Uh, Jude's a great book, however, to read and feel good about yourself. So like you can take some time this week, take a few minutes, read the entire book of Jude, then go on social media and say, I read an entire book of the Bible today. <laughs> Spiritual giant. So who, who is this guy Jude and why does he get a book in the Bible? Well, Jude, the Bible tells us, was the brother of James and he was also half brother of Jesus. Yeah, that's right. He was the brother of the Jesus. Can you imagine how hard it was growing up with Jesus as your big brother? Jude and Jesus, they, they go to the community pool to go swimming. Mary uh, makes Jude put on those big, huge orange floaties that embarrasses him because she doesn't want him to drown, but no problem for Jesus because after all, he can just walk on water. <laughs> Jude gets in trouble at school, comes home. Mary and Joseph look at him and they said, son, look at me. Why can't you be like your older brother? She's like, seriously? You want me to be like the son of God? Jude's bragging about some things happening in his life, some big moments, and then Jesus kind of casually brings up, hey, do you remember when I was born? Wise men from the east, they showed up with gifts. You know what the gifts were? Gold. <laughs> they were teenagers. Um, Jude's girlfriend broke up with him and goes to his big brother, Jesus, for help. Jesus just looked at him and said, hey, Jude, don't make it bad. <laughs> Take a sad song make it better. Remember, <laughs> let her into your heart. Na 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 na. <laughs> na 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 na. Hey, Jude. <laughs> Y'all, I got to get some credit for that. <laughs> Worked on that joke for weeks. Now, if you got that joke, you're old. <laughs> if you didn't get it, I'm old. <laughs> Now, when Jude wrote this, he was a recognized leader in the church. At this point, the church is young. It's sort of loosely uh, being put together. People are figuring out what it means to be a church, what it means to follow Jesus. Leaders like Paul and Peter, they're going place to place, city to city, church to church, and they're teaching and they're preaching. They're sharing the gospel. Uh, they're explaining what it means to follow Jesus. But at the exact same time, there's a different group of people also going around and they're teaching and they're preaching a completely different message. Uh, one that was not the gospel, one that wasn't God's plan, and the one that was taking people away from serving Jesus. Obviously, people were confused. There were too many voices saying too many different things. So how do you know what's the truth? And you, you understand, we get this today because we can find just about anybody anywhere teaching something right now. There are all kinds of people out there claiming to have secret knowledge or to speak for God. I went this week and pulled, or a couple weeks ago and pulled some books to look at, and they, they ranged from the absurd to the downright sad. Things, books taught or created to help you to know what to believe. First, uh, Jeffrey Hodson, this Catholic priest, he wrote, Fairies at Work and Play. This is a book on how to see the unseen, the fairies, gnomes, and spirits that are around your neighborhood. A lot of them in Sherwood, I think. And so from, from reading through it, and uh, you can read through this, find out what you're, you know, what he has seen them, and he'll show you how you can find them. My favorite, Nordic aliens and the Greek gods of Africa. Lost civilizations, oracles, robots, and the bird language of the gods. I want you to look carefully at the cover of this book because very helpfully the author is to let you know nonfiction. <laughs> let me just read you some of this from the back. Deep, you guys say it in my movie, was deep in the myths of history. Africa was colonized by Nordic Greek gods who spoke through a lifelong oracles embedded with two-way communication devices. They spoke in the same bird language used by Nordic aliens today. Nonfiction. <laughs> then, and more than one of the more baffling things that's out right now, this is a copy of the Jedi Compass. 
The Jedi Compass is the handbook Jedi Bible. In recent times, the Jedi have leaped from the mind of George Lucas and Star Wars trilogies to an actual religion practiced in parts of the world. Uh, you can read this book, The Jedi Compass, and know all the things you need to do to become a Jedi when you grow up. Now, these seem funny. These seem wacky. Fairies, Jedi, aliens. But people believe some of these things. On the internet, cable TV, radio, you can find just about anything. Now, the wacky is easy to spot, but it's more difficult when people take a little bit of truth and a whole lot of lies and mix them up. Or they mix Christianity with other things and try to convince us that that's the way it is. Books like this one that I found, Jesus Christ Zen Master, a book that calls Jesus an amazing, maybe the best Buddhist monk of all time. Which, by the way, uh, the quotes from Jesus aren't actually quotes from the Bible. They're from a fictional book that supposedly Jesus taught and wrote. And that's what was happening in the time of Jude. They mixed up some truth and lies, and they put them together, and they taught Christians, this is how you serve Jesus. These, these false teachers, they taught that Christians didn't have to worry about sin anymore, ever. They taught, well, God forgives you and gives you grace. And that part was true. God does forgive us. God does give us grace. And then they said, Jesus has done away with the Old Testament law and rules. And that part also was true. Oh, well, partly true. And then they drew, drew this conclusion. With, with the law gone, with no more rules, that means no more rules. Because of grace, you can live however you want. You can even sin because you live in grace. Because of grace, you can do whatever you want without consequence. And these spiritual truths, these secret things, they, they were revealed to these preachers in dreams. And no doubt, doing what you wanted sounds really good. No more sin, no more consequences for sin, do what you want. Uh, they tricked people by telling them what they wanted to hear. Notice, if you will, the attack wasn't from the outside. The attack was from the inside of the church. It wasn't persecution they were fighting. It was corruption. See, when God's people don't live like God's people, we're in trouble. Hypocrisy and immorality in God's people do far more damage to the church than a Supreme Court decision. False teaching sidetracks us more than presidential executive orders or congressional legislation. Satan wins when we are so focused on the loss of our Christian rights that we stop living right. Now, it's tempting and, and sometimes necessary to go after evils in our society. But if we aren't careful, we'll fight the wrong enemy in the wrong ways. It's easier to call government leaders immoral than to deal with the sin in your own life. It's safer to rail against society than do the difficult work of self-reflection and personal repentance. Hey, it's easier to attack the White House than clean up your house. In Jews' day, Roman leaders were corrupt and immoral. Uh, people worshiped false gods. They did stuff that you shouldn't even talk about in church. But instead of writing about those things, instead of attacking others, Jude, Jude's priority was to keep the church pure, to keep the gospel message pure and to defend it. Now, writing this letter, it, was, it wasn't easy. Verse 3 says, Dear friends, although I was very eager to write about the salvation we share, I felt I had to write and urge you to contend for the faith that was once for all entrusted to the saints. I'm a pastor. I'm a preacher. I love coming up here and talking about love and joy and peace and forgiveness and grace. I love talking about salvation. That's more fun to talk about and preach about. But a message, a sermon about salvation without a call to repentance and change is not the gospel. Because Jude's answer to the corruption that was in the church was to remind the church of some very important things. Verse 5 and verse 17 point this out. Verse 5, though you already know this, I want to remind you that the Lord delivered his people out of Egypt. Verse 17, but dear friends, remember what the apostles of our Lord Jesus Christ foretold. Jude said, I want to remind you. And he said, remember. Now, either the church had forgotten or some things are just important to keep saying over and over again. Now, I forget things. 
If I don't write it down, I forget. And the older I get, the harder it is to remember. A couple weeks ago, um, I worked late and I left the office. When I got to my car, I realized I had uh, forgotten my keys. I'd left them in uh, my office. I always put my keys in my front right, front right pocket and just couldn't find them. So I headed back to the door and that's when I realized that I had worked late and everybody had left. So now I was locked out of the office and locked out of my car. I called someone, they came up to church and let me in. Um, I went inside, I tore my office apart, couldn't find my keys. I went to the bathroom, looked in there, I looked down the hallways, looked to rooms. I went to my other, I mean, some coworkers' offices thinking maybe they'd taken my keys as a joke. I, where were these? I couldn't find them anywhere. After about 30 or 45 minutes um, of searching, frustrated, I put my, my, back, my hands in my back pockets. I don't know why I did that, I don't ever do this, but when I put my right hand in my right back pocket, guess what I felt? Keys. I don't know why my keys were in my back pocket. I don't ever put my keys in my back pocket. Who puts their keys in their back pocket? When I did, I felt stupid. I'd wasted all that time. I'd wasted the time of the person who came up to let me in, who just found out about this right now. <laughs> it's bad when it's your keys. But y'all, we can't forget the good things God has done. You, you have to remember what God has done, the stories in your life. See, I look around this room and I, I see your faces and I know your stories. God has done some amazing things in this room. God's done some amazing things in our lives. With all the gloom and doom out there and on the television, maybe we should turn off the TV and just start looking around at the stories of this room. I see what he has done. I see what he is doing. I see people in this room, you've been set free from addiction, amen? I see people in this room, you've been supernaturally healed of diseases. I see people that the world has given up on, but Jesus said, nope, that one belongs to me. I see people who were lost in sin, but came to hope in Jesus. They've come home and they've experienced his grace and salvation. Hasn't he done great things for you? Hasn't he done great things for us? It's time to remember, to remember what he's done, to remember who Jesus is, to remember and not forget. Jude back then and me right now, I'm here to remind you our God has done great things and he is in control. Life's hard, the stock market's down, prices are up, but God has not given up on us and we won't give up on him. He's our hope, he's our firm foundation. Don't forget. Now when Jude wrote this, the church was in a difficult, it was in a dangerous place. Those false teachers had been traveling around and they were actually building a rather large following. So to help keep, pe get people back on track, Jude used some stories that those Christians had heard before to remind them of the truth. Jude used these stories and we can learn from them as well. Because we also need to be reminded of, say, of some things. Because I know, it's hard. You're the only Christian in your family. And your family says, hey, it's okay to miss church this weekend. You can miss church every now and then. It really, you don't have to go every week, do you? It's okay, you can skip. You're the only person doing right in your, with your friends at school and they want you to cheat and they say, everybody else is cheating. You have to go along with this. Everybody else does it. It won't matter. No one will ever find out. You're in recovery, but all your old friends, they keep saying, come on, it's just one party. It's just one weekend. It's just one drink. It's just one night. You see, the enemy always attacks truth. And I'm here to remind you of the truth, the real truth. That when you're under attack, when the truth is under attack in your life, you have to remember to stay faithful to God. He's been faithful. You have to be faithful. Jude wrote this in verse five, though you already know all this. I wanna remind you that the Lord delivered his people out of Egypt but later destroyed those who did not believe. You see the two parts of that verse? Part one, the Lord delivered his people. That's great news, isn't it? Aren't you grateful for the delivering power of Jesus in your life? But the second part is not so great. But the Lord later destroyed those who did not believe. Like, like what? Wait. God saved them to destroy them? That doesn't make a lot of sense. I think Jude was reminding them, and Jude is telling us today, that past victories are not permission for future failure. You see, God had delivered his people out of Egypt. You've never heard the story. It's, it's amazing. 
Uh, God's people were trapped. They were slaves in Egypt, and they cried out to God, and God sent 10 plagues uh, to Egypt. And Pharaoh said, all right, your people, can, these people can go. And so the children of Israel, they left. They were set free by this miraculous work of God. They got all the way to the Red Sea, and Pharaoh and his armies, they changed their minds, and now they're chasing him. And so they've got the Red Sea that they can't cross in front of them, and they've got this army trying to kill him from behind. And God does a powerful, powerful miracle, and the, the waters part. The children of Israel cross through on dry land. Uh, they go through the Red Sea. Pharaoh's army is destroyed. They're, they're, this powerful miracle. They get through on the other side, and then everywhere they go, when they're doing right, God, God protects them, keeps them safe. When they're hungry, God gives them food in the morning. When they wake up, when they're thirsty, rocks start shooting water out. It has been this spectacular miracle after miracle after miracle. And after the people watched God do those miracles, God watched the people rebel against him. And the result, they died in the desert. Listen, God can rescue you from Egypt, but you can choose to die in the desert. See, rescue comes with responsibility. The responsibility to do right and to keep moving forward. My friend Mike was a homeless teenager, horrible story. Parents abandoned him. He grew up on the streets. He got addicted to alcohol and drugs. His life was a mess, but he came back. He came to church. He got saved. He was clean and sober for several years. He was active in ministry. You saw him all the time around here. One day he was talking with me and he said, hey, Pastor Randy, I think, I think maybe I can go back and hang out with my old friends again. I'm a strong enough Christian. He said, I think actually I can drink again because I, I've, I'm, I'm strong enough in the Lord. I, you know, I'm a good Christian. I, nothing's going to happen to me. Well, you know what happened. It wasn't long before Mike was back on the streets living homeless again. It's sad. You have to remember to stay faithful. Keep doing the right things. Keep coming to church. Keep saying no to temptation. We give God great thanks and we worship him for past victories, but we don't forget we're still in a fight today. Stay faithful. Now look at verse six. It's kind of an interesting, a little confusing story, but I think it'll make sense as we read it. Jude said, I want to remind you of the angels who did not keep their positions of authority, but abandoned their own home. These he kept in darkness, bound with everlasting chains for judgment on the great day. Now, before God created the world, he created heaven and the angels. And some of those angels, they joined Satan and they rebelled against God. Now, that's hard for us to imagine. After all, all we want to do is we want to get to heaven. They were in heaven and they left. Why would they do that? Well, it's clear that Satan is angels. They they had greed. They had pride. They thought their plan was better than God's. And they were willing to move away from God to achieve it. Their plan was better. And Jude reminded them and reminds us that our plans are not better than God's plans. And you have to do the same thing Jude was telling those people back then. You have to stay close to God. Remember these angels, they were in heaven with God, but they left because they wanted more. And when you think you deserve better, when you think what you want is more important than what God has for you, you put yourself in really bad places. Stay close to God. Don't leave. Because look what happened to these angels. Outside of God's plan, outside of his blessing, when they went away from him, they gave up heaven and they got darkness and chains. Remember, when you remove yourself from God's presence, you remove yourself from God's blessing. Stay with God. Stay where God wants you. And it's tempting to move away from God. Think, I don't need church every week, or I don't need to read my Bible every day. I don't have to go to CR all the time. I don't need reality every Wednesday night. No, you need to stay close to God. Students, that's why your class pastors and your leaders, they chase you when they don't see you in church. It's why your recovery sponsors are after you when, you don't hear from, when they don't hear from you. Because bad things happen when you move away from where God is is. Stay close. I want to challenge you. Find where God is working and get right in the middle of it. Don't walk away from God. Those foolish angels, they left and they left heaven and look what happened. Don't give up on church. Don't give up on your place in ministry. Don't give up on God. Stay close to him. But Jude wasn't finished. He also went after those false teachers who said people could sin and it wouldn't matter. Verse 4, For certain men whose condemnation was written about long ago have secretly slipped in among you. 
They are godless men who change the grace of our God into a license for immorality and deny Jesus Christ, our only sovereign Lord. And then he got real specific. He confronted the sexual immorality in those teachings. And Jude said, and don't forget, Sodom and Gomorrah and the surrounding towns gave themselves up to sexual immorality and perversion. They serve as an example of those who suffer the punishment of eternal fire. Now, when this letter was first written, it was read out loud to the whole church for the first time. No doubt it was super quiet at that moment, almost as quiet as it is in here right now. Because these are hard words. Jude compared these people who who were preachers who gave permission for sexual immorality and for those who participated in it, that they were going to be judged just like Sodom and Gomorrah. Eternal fire. It was a pretty stark and stern warning. It's this, stay away from sin. Those, those people had slipped in and said sin didn't matter. You've probably heard the same thing or maybe you've thought it yourself. Well, God loves me. God, and if God loves me, he wants me to be happy. So doing this makes me happy. So really God doesn't care because my happiness is more important than anything. Or God is love. So he loves everybody no matter what they could do. So it doesn't matter. God's love. So love wins over everything. Or God knows that I want to do the right thing even if I don't do the right thing, so I should get some bonus points just from wanting to do the right thing, right? Well, everyone sins now and then. I mean, like, I've had six pretty good weeks. I can take a weekend off, right? I've done pretty good for the last couple months. Maybe I can just, this one, this, I, I, it's kind of cumulative, right? Or maybe, maybe the most scary one of all, God will forgive me so I'll just go ahead and do it and then ask for his forgiveness later. You can always find people who will tell you you can live however you want. They'll find creative, even spiritual ways to give you permission to do unholy things. And Jude said, these are godless people who change grace into a permission to sin. Watch out for false teachers and people who say that the Bible is outdated and not relevant so you don't have to follow it anymore. Watch out for people who, who try to push on you a soft kind of Christianity that says you can do whatever want you want because God loves you. Yes, God does love you. He loves you so much. He wants you to stop this destructive behavior and experience the life that he intends for you to have. He loves you so much, he has something better for you. You also have to watch out for spiritual leaders who tell you how to live your life, but then themselves don't do it. Remember, the test of a godly leader is not how much Bible verses they can quote. The test is obedience to God's word. You can be super spiritual and a super sinner. Just because someone quotes scripture or associates with Christians doesn't mean they're from God. Just because the person is on TV and has amazing graphics, prophecy charts, claims supernatural insight, uh, can quote the Bible better than you, or has what looks like miracles taking place, doesn't mean that person is from God or godly. Remember, Satan masquerades as a servant of light. He pretends to be a good guy. He's not foolish. He wants to destroy you. Run from people who teach that God won't judge sin because he's a God of love. Run from people who say because of grace, you can sin and it doesn't matter. God will not tolerate ongoing sin among his people. You cannot expect to experience the benefits of following Jesus when you don't actually follow him. You can't expect heaven when you walk the road to hell. Remember, Stay faithful, stay close to God, and stay away from sin. And that's pretty convicting. 
And maybe you're worried you've gone too far or there's no hope for you. What are you supposed to do this? You, you, you say, Randy, I've been unfaithful. This is heavy. What do, what, is there hope for me? Well, there is because before we leave, I want to point out one more thing from Jude. We go all the way back to the very first verse, Jude 1. It starts this way, Jude, a servant of Jesus Christ and a brother of James. Now, those are simple words. And you might just blow past them when you're reading because you want to get to the meat of the letter. Is that probably just him identifying himself? But they're more powerful when you remember who said them and who wrote them. When we began this message, I told you Jesus had a, or Jude had a famous half brother. His name was what? Jesus. And Jude and Jesus, they have this complicated story in the Bible. Let's take a look at it. In Mark chapter 3, we read this Then Jesus entered a house, and again a crowd gathered. So that he and his disciples were not even able to eat. Verse 21, when his family, which would have been Jude, heard about this, they went to take charge of them for they said he is out of his mind. Jude thought Jesus was crazy. And then in John chapter 7, we see even more of this complicated relationship. Verse 2 of chapter 7, but when the Jewish feast of tabernacles was near, Jesus' brothers, that would have been Jude, said to him, you ought to leave here and go to Judea so that your disciples may see the miracles you do. And you read that and you think, awesome, he's for them, like his brothers are for them. But then you realize this statement is filled with attack and sarcasm because then he says, no one wants to become a public figure, acts in secret. Since you're doing these things, show yourself to the world. Verse 5, for even even his own brothers did not believe in him. Jesus' family didn't support him. They weren't big fans of him. Jude thought he was crazy and didn't believe in Jesus. But that's not the whole story. Something spectacular happens to Jude along the way. We don't know when it happened, but it's clear from Scripture because Jude goes from someone who thinks Jesus is crazy to verse 1, he's now a servant of Jesus Christ. And that's this translation, but sometimes another word is used there, and that word is a slave of Jesus Christ. Jude called himself a slave of his brother. Now, I have a brother. His name is Greg. I love him, but I ain't Greg's slave. <laughs> I ain't even his servant. <laughs> but there's a powerful transformation that takes place. He goes from He's crazy to I will serve him as my Lord. It's the last thing I want to remind you. If you walk away, don't stay away from Jesus. Jude came back. He came back to relationship with Jesus and to his Lord. And I want to challenge you to stay away from sin, but don't stay away from Jesus. Jesus died for everyone's sins, including his brother Jude. Jesus came back to life to ensure that salvation for everyone, including his brother Jude. And he did the same thing for you as well. Jude, who tried to stop Jesus, was now a leader in the church. And I want you to remember, it's never too late to follow Jesus. It's never too late for Jesus, and it's never too late for you. You're never so far gone that you can't follow him. You're ne you've never gone so far that you can't turn back to him in this moment. You've never, you, I don't care what you've done or how many times you've done it, Jesus is for you.